and welcome to Digest This, where we discuss clinical topic in gastroenterology. My name is Francesca Moroni, I'm one of the gastroenterology trainees in the north of Scotland. Today, we are discussing inflammatory bowel disease, new frontiers of medical treatment. And I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Gareth Rhys-Jones, consultant gastroenterologist at the Western General of Edinburgh and clinical scientist at the University of Edinburgh. Welcome, Gareth. Thanks, Fran. Thanks for having me. So, Gareth, to put this topic in context today, could you give us a run-through of the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease with special focus on UK and Scotland? Sure. I think we've got to appreciate that uh, worldwide the uh, landscape of inflammatory bowel disease has, has exploded really over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and I think what we're increasingly seeing is phases in epidemiology depending on where you live in the world. So for example in the uh, developing world they're seeing a significant rise in incidence um, but, obviously, but also with that because they live in the developing world quite high levels of mortality. But then when you move into the developed world in Northern Europe and Canada and, and the US uh, what's quite striking is is that incidence has plateaued. So the number of new patients diagnosed each year is pretty constant. That's the data we have in Edinburgh for the past 10 years. But what we see is just like a, a, a running a tap into a bath, uh, the, the number of new patients diagnosed each year far outweighs those, uh, those number of patients that die each year. And then so inexorably, year on year, what we see is this idea of compounding prevalence. So that every year you're getting more patients added to the inflammatory bowel disease pool, so to say. Um, and what will be really interesting over the next 10 or 15 years uh, will be to see if that, if that changes at all. Do we get a, 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 an equilibrium uh, in prevalence? And for that to happen, either instance has to drop or due to the aging population, uh, uh, more patients have to pass away. So what that means in Edinburgh, uh, from the, the study that we did uh, in 2018 published in GUT, uh, was we looked at all the patients that with inflammatory bowel disease in Edinburgh and we forecast that every year that will increase by 5%. So that means that for the total Edinburgh population uh, in eight years time about 1% of people will be affected with inflammatory bowel disease. And the second really important thing when we looked at the demographics, the breakdown of, of, of ages within that cohort, what we see is, is as in most uh, chronic diseases in the Western world, a shift to an older and aging population. So that, that for us in Edinburgh means that in eight years' time, over half of our patients are going to be over the age of 50. And that has, clearly will have massive implications in terms of access to treatment, how we provide care for these people. Uh, and also, you know, in the context of earlier combination immunosuppression, there's, there's a, a nuance to those conversations that needs to be had. So did you see a change in natural history of inflammatory bowel disease since the advent of biologic therapy? That's a, that's a great question. So I think we've got to frame that in the, the, the landscape of, uh, of uh, treatment in inflammatory bowel disease has just been revolutionized in the last five or ten years. We're using uh, the uh, quite potent immunosuppressions earlier and earlier in, in a patient's uh, disease course. Uh, and that's because we understand, particularly for Crohn's disease, it's a progressive illness. At the start of disease, uh, almost all uh, of patients have an inflammatory phenotype. So it's been coined this term, the inflammatory window of opportunity. We know our drugs work best uh, with inflammation. They're not good at treating, uh, penetrating or for, uh, stenosing disease. Uh, and therefore, what we can see is we look at uh, cohorts over the last 20 years who've been treated with biologics. Those who were treated with more biologics with a more recent diagnosis uh, from Phil Jenkins and data in Edinburgh uh, tell us that the number of patients needing to have a subtotal colectomy uh, for UC, those patients needing to have an intestinal resection for Crohn's disease is significantly reduced. What we can't say is ascribe causality to that. You know, it's not fair, I think, in 2021 to have a controlled trial of patients that are treated with biologics and not treated with biologics and then followed up for many, many years. So we have to rely on this retrospective data. Uh, so with the caveats that, you know, when NICE uh, approved uh, anti-TNF and the anti integrin therapy in 2014, we see this really clear inflection point towards a reduction in a colectomy in ulcerative colitis we can't uh, we can't expressly say that's uh, that's a causal link but it, but 
the striking changes in treatment must, we think, hopefully be having a, uh, an impact on, on the likelihood for a patient to have a more complicated disease course. There's more evidence for that if we look elsewhere. So the landmark uh, CALM trial, treat to target trial, that's now a couple of years old, looked at uh, whether we uh, base a patient's tr uh, treatment on symptoms alone or symptoms with a biomarker like fecal calprotectin. And what it clearly showed was uh, if we used uh, calprotectin with symptoms, i.e. made treatment decisions in asymptomatic patient patients just based on biomarkers, you significantly improve mucosal healing at 12 months when using a combination of, uh, of a mimine modulator uh, and anti-TNF adalimumab in this instance. Um, and more locally, Nick Pleveris has, has got some beautiful data that's, uh, that's just been published in uh, Clinical Gastro HEP. Uh, where we took all the new patients with Crohn's disease over the last uh, 10 years and then asked if we were able to, whatever treatment we used, if we were able to normalize their inflammatory burden, normalize their calprotectin at 12 months, did that protect them from risk of surgery and hospitalization over time? And it was, and again, very strikingly, we could see that However we get there, if we can get patients' inflammation much better, early as possible, we think we're probably protecting them for the longer term. Very interesting indeed. I think we should really take advantage of your immunology PhD, and it would be great if you could really explain to the clinician how the drugs work, so this biologics that we feel like is almost like a fine art. So what's the mechanism of action or the drugs we have available for IBD? Yeah. I think it always amazes me, uh, even now having used, you know, anti-TNF has, has been used in the UK for nearly 20 years. Um, and it's even now, we're still really getting to grips with how these drugs work. Um, so the short answer is I think there's, a, there's more that we don't know than we do know about how these drugs work, particularly how they influence the immunology, not just in the short term, but also probably in the longer term. So, for example, the anti-TNF monoclonal antibodies in fliximab, golimumab, uh, adalimumab, it always amazes me that um, if you um, use monoclonal antibodies to try and block the anti-TNF chemical, obviously it's showing really great efficacy in Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease. But what, what, what uh, is difficult to understand uh, is that, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, where they use um, anti-TNF receptor blockers, those don't work in Crohn's disease. So it can't just be blocking the receptor and the chemical meeting. So the current you know, 2020 understanding about how anti-TNF works uh, is that each anti-TNF molecule probably binds to about four infliximab molecules. An active TNF is probably a, a trimer of three molecules. So the way I think of that is that anti-TNF in a patient with active inflammatory bowel disease is probably surrounded by at least 12 or 15 times as many molecules as uh, of infliximab and adalimumab. So that forms this big complex. And it's these complexes we think that are important in binding to things like activated macrophages via FC gamma receptor signaling, which then turn off, switch off other downstream uh, kind of cytokines and chemokines. Um, but I, I come back to my first point. I think there's more that we don't know about how these drugs work than, than, than we do. Um, Anti-TNF, for example, is really interesting is that it works best early on in treatment, as I, as I said earlier on, this inflammatory window of opportunity. But what we don't understand at the moment is why if we use anti-TNF first and then use another drug afterwards, why, they don't, why those drugs don't work so well. Is that just because we're biasing to a more complicated, uh, more aggressive disease within our patients? Possibly. Um, you know, I you know I would be very interested to see are we uh, curating or educating the immune system in some way so that with every subsequent drug is just a uh, there's a law of diminishing returns. And I think that's again something that I'm interested in following up. With regards to the anti-integrins, again, there's a lot that we, we know and a lot that we don't know. So the alpha-4, beta-7, uh, uh, a monoclonal antibodies, things like vedolizumab, the way that they work is they're supposed to stop T-cell trafficking to an inflamed gut, binding to MADCAM receptors on the endothelium, this kind of lock and key GPS system, I, call to, I say it to the patients, these activated T-cells that leave the, the gut lymphoid organs, migrate via the gut, and then go back to this area of inflammation. Thank you.
So that mechanistically makes sense to me. You're kind of trying to block pro-inflammatory T-cell subsets getting back to the gut. Um, but I guess what doesn't make sense is that, again, since the drug's being used, what we're understanding is that the, the spectrum of use is probably not just T-cell homing. In fact, a lot of the, the studies that have come out in the last few years, Stefan Schreiber had a, a really beautiful paper in 2018 showing that monocytes and macrophages are probably really important in how they're recruited to the gut. And there's two other bits of evidence, I think, that I, that I, I don't know how to fit together with, with vedolizumab. The first is that if you look at the, the saturation of the uh, alpha-4, beta-7 on T cells, uh, you can show that those receptors, are the, the integrin on the surface of the T cells is fully, is fully um, uh, saturated. Uh, so that doesn't really explain to me why if you give much higher doses, even though the receptor is saturated, why do patients continue to get better? There must be an additional mode of action out with those T cell subsets. And the last, I guess, most you know, um, uh, recent piece of data is from the etralizumab study. Uh, so etralizumab is a combination of alpha-4, beta-7 and an alpha-E, beta-7. So you get, should get a dual anti-integrin blocking. So hypothetically, that should be even better at blocking other subsets coming to the gut. Um, but actually, all of the data that's coming out is to show that it, this doesn't work or doesn't work anywhere near as well as vedolizumab. So I think, again, uh, until we really get to grips with the nuts of bolts of, of how these different drugs affect the immune system, we're always going to unfortunately get a situation where we're currently in, which is that about half of our patients treated with these drugs uh, you know, don't get better after 12 months. So my next question was really... Do we know which drugs to choose with which patient? But, you know, the hopes are not really high. Well, I, I think there's, again, you know, uh, if you look at all of the landmark um, genome-wide association studies that were done that are now some 10 years old, I mean, they told us an awful lot about um, the sorts of pathways which potentially were, uh, were dysregulated in people with inflammatory bowel disease. And those are instantly quite conserved across ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, so it's things like IL-23 signaling, you know, JAK-STAT signaling. Um, uh, and that's obviously has is, is led to this uh, explosion of medicines like uh, uh, Stellara or Ustakinumab, which targets the P40 common subunit of IL-12-23, and then some of the newer drugs, which we can talk about but later, such as Rizinkizumab, which, which targets selectively kind of P19 signaling. So I went to talks five, 10 years ago where they were saying, you know, in 2020, you'll be able to take a blood test, you'll work out which pathway is the problem one, and you'll give patients treatment based on that. And I think the reality again is, is that we're not there yet. Um, James Lee and Miles Parks down in Cambridge are doing a, a, a really beautiful study called the Profile Study. Uh, and that's based on this observation that if you take patients with IBD at diagnosis, and you look, look at the transcriptome, the gene expression signature of a subset of T cells, the CD8 T cells, you can distinguish at diagnosis, even before treatment, those patients that are more likely to have a complicated disease course. So I think there's messages there in terms of uh, integrating to the clinic uh, areas, pathways that we think might be dysregulated, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, what I think will be the main uh, game changer in the next kind of five, ten years will be the, the use of head-to-head -head studies. So the Varsity trial, uh, which is looking at, which was published last year, looking at um, a head-to-head -head study of adalimumab versus vedolizumab in patients with moderately to, to severely active ulcerative colitis. Um, and quite clearly showed probably what anecdotally we thought in the clinic is that vedolizumab is probably a better drug for maintenance uh, of, of ulcerative colitis than adalimumab. So I think, you know, taking that to the to the next step, you know, I'd love to see these head to heads, you know, Ustakinumab first line in UC versus Vedalizumab, you know, do using, you know, Ustakinumab or, or Tofacitinib, for example, uh, in ulcerative colitis, and then really kind of giving the clinician a, a, a better toolbox to know which drugs to use when, and then sequencing those drugs, you know, uh, most appropriately so that patients get the, the right drug at the right time. So at the moment, what is your clinical approach? So I think at the moment it's a contentious area. Um, so uh, I think in ulcerative colitis, I think the Octave study looking at tofacitinib has, be, it was, has been the biggest change in my practice. Um, so uh, the Octave study, for those not familiar with it, is tofacitinib is a, a JAK inhibitor. Uh, uh, it's a small molecule, an orally administered drug uh, 
Um, uh, and they show some really nice data uh, at 12 months that, that, uh, of uh, remission rates of up to 50% in patients and mucosal healing in about a third. Um, so I think that, that addition into the, the ulcerative colitis pathway, I think, has been uh, the biggest change to me. Um, I think that there's still a role probably for thiopurines uh, in, in select circumstances. So the patients with isolated ileal or Crohn's disease, I think there's a role perhaps there with you uh, in the absence of other kind of, you know, uh, worrying features that might make you think that this patient might have a more uh, complicated disease course. Uh, and also in the steroid dependent uh, ulcerative colitis patients. Um, so I think it's a contentious area. I think sequencing for me is, as, as I said, is going to, we should be basing it on, on controlled trial data and we wait with anticipation these these head-to-head -head studies that are coming out over the next few years. What are the new kids on the block? What drugs are coming out and what can we use it for? So I think probably there's two main drugs I think that will be coming to the practice in the next few years uh, to talk about. Um, so We've spoken about ustekinumab, which uh, is an, a monoclonal antibody against the common P40 subunit of IL-12 and IL-23. Um, so rizankizumab, as I mentioned earlier, is a monoclonal antibody directed directly against the P19 subunit. What that means in practice is that you should selectively target the IL-23 pathway more efficiently. Uh, again, the, the phase three trials look encouraging. You know, there's a 40% clinical remission rate, I think, at 12 weeks. Uh, so those clinical trials have now stopped recruiting. Uh, and so we're really just waiting for the, the fine detail. The devil's always in the detail with these clinical trials. And that would be, so I think that would be a, a, a really nice monoclonal, another one of the monoclonal antibodies. Um, in terms of uh, a slightly different way of working, so uh, Ozanimod, uh, is a drug that will probably come to the practice in the next few years. And that's a completely different type of drug that we've not seen before. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess, in a similar vein to vedalizumab to try and influence le leukocyte trafficking. Uh, what this molecule does is a smaller molecule that blocks lymphocyte leaving the gut lymphoid organs. So instead of kind of stopping them getting to the gut, you're stopping them leaving the lymphoid organs to recirculate via the blood and then go back into the into areas of inflammation. Uh, and again, that shows quite encouraging uh, early data. But, you know, as with the etrolizumab study I spoke to you earlier about, I think we've got to really wait for the controlled dial data before we kind of think about how those fit in terms of our, our drug sequencing pathway. Very exciting times for inflammatory bowel disease. Very exciting si times for... Uh... You know, researcher like yourself, what is actually exciting the most in the future of IBD treatment? Well, I think there's, I think there's an awful lot to be really excited for, particularly in Scotland. Um, so there's some fantastic work being done all around Scotland that I think will really, uh, you know, put our patients at the forefront of the best care in the world. Uh, you know, so Costas, who is one of the uh, uh, dietitian leads here in Glasgow, is, is running the CD Treat trial, uh, which is looking at using dietary modification to try and improve outcome uh, in both adults and children, and that, uh, and that looks really exciting. Uh, Go Zaho, who's one of the clinician scientists who works with me in Edinburgh, uh, has done a real uh, uh, bench to bedside approach. Uh, so he is, he's taken a, uh, a drug that inhibits uh, how the mitochondria, they're kind of uh, the powerhouses of the cells. So they release these kind of damage associated proteins. Uh, he's got a, a drug that's coming into clinical trials imminently uh, called the, in the MARVEL trial uh, in moderately active ulcerative colitis. So a completely, you know, novel way of, of looking at uh, these conditions. And then lastly, you know, Professor Charles Lees in, uh, in Edinburgh is, is doing kind of groundbreaking work in the environmental influences of inflammatory bowel disease. You know, what is it, you know, in, in a patient's lifestyle in terms of stress or diet uh, that might be influencing the chance to have a flare, this deterioration in patient symptoms. So I think, you know, uh, significant cause for optimism. Well, the only thing is left for me to say is to thank you for a wonderful run through this really interesting topic and to thank you for joining us for Digestis. Mm -hmm.